On tobacco, I'd like to begin with a few stories to make it accessible to you. There's a big fight going on. It's very interesting. If you understand the fight, you'll understand how the trade rules are at stake. And I'll talk briefly about the, I'll show you a picture of the competing frameworks I just talked about. I'll uh, race through the, the, the threats that I think exist in the TPPA. Um, by threat, I mean rules that countries or investors could use to challenge restrictions on tobacco sales. Um, there's a US proposal on treatment of tobacco, which has not yet been tabled, as they say. It's not been formally put before other countries. But uh, I've seen a summary, and I've heard US negotiators talk about it, so I can tell you what it looks like. And then we can get into some oversight questions. The story begins with what you know, which is that since 1965, according to this chart, smoking rates in the United States have gradually declined year after year after year. Uh, they're half of what they used to be. And in response to that, American tobacco companies no longer see the US market as a growth market for themselves. They do see growth markets, particularly South America and Southeast Asia. When the TPPA was announced um, in early 2010, Philip Morris International, the Virginia Corporation, um, which presides over 43 international subsidiary companies, different places around the world, wrote to US trade negotiators saying, um, we're happy you're negotiating this new agreement. We want you to continue treating tobacco like any other sector. We want the benefits of zero tariffs on tobacco products. And remember now, we're talking about a global corporation. So it's not just US exports. It's trade between their subsidiaries and other countries. Uh, they want increased market access that comes from not only lower tariffs, but rules on services that regulate tobacco advertising marketing and distribution, and they want rights as foreign investors. That's what they asked for in their written comments. Four weeks later, after asking for the United States negotiators to give them the benefits of the TPPA, including investor rights, Philip Morris filed the first claim against tobacco regulations using an international investment agreement, a bilateral treaty between Switzerland and Uruguay. Switzerland is the corporate home of PMI's trademarks, um, a subsidiary based in Luzon, Switzerland. Tabari Vasquez is the former president of Uruguay, and he's an interesting past president because he was a, an oncologist, a doctor who treats cancer. <laughs> so during his term in office, he noticed that as American smoking rates went down, Uruguay's smoking rates were going up and he began a process of regulation. He was especially concerned that the fastest growing smoker population in his country was kids. And so there became a kind of a cause and effect sequence of moves by the tobacco company and moves by the government of Uruguay, led by this doctor as president. So smoking rates increase in Uruguay. Uruguay requires warnings on packages much like we've seen on US cigarette packages. Youth smoking continues to increase in Uruguay by leaps and bounds. Uruguay responds to that by banning misleading terms. You can no longer sell lights in Uruguay under the theory that smokers get the impression that light cigarettes are less toxic. Well, if you smoke the same amount, that might be true, but people who smoke light cigarettes tend to smoke. When, when Uruguay said you can't call them lights, the tobacco company shifted to colors. So there was red, gold, and blue. So the red was the full strength. Uh, the blue was the menthol and the gold or the silver was the so-called light cigarette. So to combat that, Uruguay said, okay, you get one brand. There's one kind of Marlboro. And on top of that, we're going to require that you provide a graphic warnings. They call them pictographs there, and they're amazingly ugly and disgusting. They are pictures of what happens to you when you smoke and, and get cancer. Uh, they are designed to be not pretty. So PMI files its investment claim. And this is a trajectory that we're seeing in other countries as well. Um, this whole process was very soon replicated in Australia, which is one of the TPP countries. Australia, going through the similar sequence, adopted plain packaging rather than the single brand law. You know, the plain packages are like olive drab. If there's the name of the brand, it'll say Marlboro, 
in 12 point font, um, but it looks like any other cigarette package, and 80% of the package is dominated by this graphic warning picture of somebody with a tobacco related disease. And the clear purpose of the legislation is to suppress sales and consumption of the tobacco product. There's no bones about that. And so in both cases, PMI has brought an investment claim against these countries saying, our life is our trademark. If we can't market our trademark, we can't market our cigarettes. John can't walk into the store and know the difference between a Marlboro and a Salem or whatever else might be tempting him. So you've taken our ability to compete. That's a big deal. And from the company's point of view, that makes a lot of sense, right? You've taken away their ability to compete. That's the purpose of the law. So you've taken our You've taken the lifeblood of our enterprise, um, compensate us. We have an international investment agreement that entitles us to compensation for just that. So from the company's point of view, from a business point of view, those arguments make total sense. And from the government's public health point of view, those regulations are what it takes because everything else up until now didn't work. So what should government do? Give up, not care that more kids are smoking and that those kids will become adults and that they will have cancer? So you've got this perfect storm, this perfect conflict, if you will, between the tobacco framework and the trade framework. That's what makes it such a gripping story. So the fact that PMI is based in Virginia is beside the point. They have a subsidiary in a country that has a bilateral investment treaty with Uruguay. That's what you hire lawyers for. Where should we, where should we place our subsidiary that manages all of our patents and all of our trademarks? Oh, let's, let's place it in a country that's famous for its neutrality, its banking secrecy, and that has a lot of bilateral treaties with developing countries where we want to sell cigarettes. That's worth a few thousand dollars in legal fees, because it'll save you a few billion dollars down the road if you can use these rules to your advantage. And the same applies for taxation. I mean, that's just the way the system works, right? But the answer to your question is simply that your government agrees to follow these rules and from Uruguay's point of view, they probably signed this treaty, I think, in the late 80s. <clears throat> and they had expectations of European banks and European service suppliers coming in and helping build their economy. And they felt that given their reputation as not quite as unstable as Argentina, but you know, not as stable as Europe, um, that this would give them a, an advantage in recruiting capital to their country. Well, along with the banks and the construction companies, they got to the, the tobacco companies as well. So when Uruguay adopted these measures, it was not simply acting on its own. It was acting within the umbrella framework of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the FCTC. Every measure that Uruguay adopted that I just told you fits in one of the niches of the FCTC's framework. It's the first global health treaty. It has 175 parties. It has more signatories than I have here. That's an error. It sets minimum obligations and it ensures stronger measures. And what Uruguay did was go beyond the minimum expectations of the FCTC. They became the cutting edge, the most robust set of tobacco controls in the world at the, t the time they adopted these measures. So they attracted that lightning that I told you about. Lightning is attracted to the highest point. In this case, it was Uruguay. Not because Uruguay was a huge market that PMI cared about so much as a market, it's a fairly tiny country. It, it, was, it was a symbol and it was a trendsetter. If Uruguay's measures actually work to suppress tobacco sales and consumption, guess what happens next? Other, the other 174 parties of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control said, let's do it, it works. We don't have to be the first anymore. We'll follow Uruguay's example. So PMI is bringing this claim to essentially chill the FCTC in its implementation process. They don't want Uruguay to be the model anymore. Win, lose, or draw, they're going to force Uruguay to spend a lot of money defending this claim. Uruguay didn't have the money. In fact, Uruguay almost caved because they didn't have the money. It takes about a million dollars a year for several years to defend yourself in one of these forums in legal fees alone. So what happened was the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and other anti-tobacco advocates went through their pockets and their bank accounts for loose change and came up with well over $500,000 and wrote a check to the government of Uruguay to, to defend itself. 
So even there, the tobacco company achieved what they've achieved in prior litigation. They've been able to bleed their opposition dry by essentially sucking money out of the, the bank accounts of organizations that had they not brought the case, they would have spent that money in anti-tobacco campaigns in the same countries. So you see that tactically <coughs> these, these investment disputes are quite valuable, even if you don't win the case. Is the U.S. a, a signatory to the FCTC? The United States signed it but did not ratify it. So what does that mean? That means that the United States had a chance to influence the, the treaty as it was negotiated and there are a number of trade-related terms in there that are trade-friendly uh, that tend to dampen down the regulatory ambitions of the FCTC. But when it came time to actually submitting it to Congress for ratification, that has yet to be done. So we're not bound by it? We're not Is bound that what by it. Means? And we're not part of it. That's right. So that has significant implications within tobacco regulation in this country? We are the only TPPA country not to be a member of this treaty. So when I talked about framework, let me just give you an example. On the left-hand column of this chart, you can see there are a series of tobacco measures that are called for by this framework convention. It's not a convention that is actually effective on its own. It calls upon each country to adopt laws that fill in the holes. So <clears throat> there's an obligation to increase your consumption taxes. The TPPA reduces tariffs to zero, which has the same effect as a tax. If you look at um, Article 13 of the FCTC, it, it calls for countries to ban tobacco ads. And if you cannot ban them under your constitution, then it calls upon you to restrict them as much as you can. The trade framework has rules in it that say um, you may not um, put limits on services. It prohibits certain kinds of limits on services like distribution, marketing, or sale of tobacco products. So you get the point. For every element of the FCTC, there's an element of the trade framework that blocks. So uh, let me walk you through a couple examples of how specific chapters of the FCTC uh, could strengthen the hand of the tobacco companies. And uh, I'll try to be selective and not cover all of them. But since you were really keen on investment earlier, uh, let's start with that. So investment agreements provide an arbitration forum, which we were just discussing. You don't have to use domestic courts. And a set of foreign investor rights. And I think I've already explained the mechanism here. Philip Morris International is telling Uruguay and Australia, you've so constricted our ability to use our trademarks, you've effectively taken it. That's called an indirect expropriation. In addition, the way you managed your lawmaking process we think was unfair and inequitable. You're creating an unstable regulatory environment. And you're not taking into account the kind of scientific information that we, the tobacco company, believes you should have to establish to prove your laws will work. They're actually arguing that um, they're arguing that they support, they, the tobacco company, supports regulation of tobacco, but the laws should only be sustained under trade rules when they, af when they effectively reduce consumption of tobacco products. Wrap your head around that one. They're demanding the countries produce science that the law will work. What do, I, what do they mean by that? What they mean is that if you adopt this law without the science to support it, you're just going to drive people into the black market. You'll, it'll be like prohibition in the, in the alcohol phase of the United States. So people will go into the black market. There will still be consumption. It'll just be out of sight. You won't be able to tax it. You won't be able to regulate it. So your law will backfire. We'll lose our profits. You won't achieve anything. That's their argument. And they're using fair and equitable treatment as the, as the term in the investment agreement to make that argument. So it's pretty interesting and kind of subtle. I mean, it's not like as black and white as you might think from a public health versus um, tobacco profit point of view. And that's the point of their argument. Intellectual property. There's a big debate about whether tobacco companies have a right to use their trademarks. The tobacco companies in the Uruguay case say, we already have such a right. But if you carefully read through the, the intellectual property provisions of the WTO agreement, you have a right to use your trademark unto yourself and keep other people from using your trademark 
but there's nothing in it that says government can't restrict your ability to use that trademark. And there's even language in there that says, for public health reason, you, you can restrict the use of a trademark. Can you go so far as to effectively take it, everything except trademark and name only? Well, that's the open question. Now comes the TPPA, which actually includes a proposal from the United States to give a right to use a trademark. Um, <clears throat> I wish we could talk about this for a long time, but I'll give you the really short version. It's all about cheese. The cheese producers of the United States and New Zealand particularly want to be able to sell Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese and any other number of cheeses that have European names because that's where the cheese was invented. But shucks, I mean, Parmesan cheese from Wisconsin can be made in such a way that it tastes something similar to Parmesan cheese from Italy, they argue. So why shouldn't we be able to market under the name Parmesan? So that's what this is all about. And so the cheese producers convinced US trade negotiators in the absence of the European Union, which by the way takes the flip opposite position in the WTO, and they're, so there's a, this is a WTO fight. So let's avoid the Europeans. We'll create our own trade agreement, take our football and go home, and we'll come up with a rule that the Europeans will hate. And that rule says, you have a right to use a trademark if you refer to a place name so long as it's not deceptive. So for example, if you name your product um, after a, a city where consumers understand that it really wasn't made there, you have a right to use that product name. And along with it, any symbols, colors, designs, pictures, anything else that goes along with the trademark. So can a tobacco company take advantage of this cheese rule? Think Salem. Think Marlboro. Think Winston. These are all names of towns in the southeastern United States. In fact, there are four or five Marlboros in the southeast region, not just the one uh, in Virginia. There are a whole bunch of Salems, not just the one in North Carolina. It perfectly fits the scenario. So if this were adopted as proposed, it would be a blueprint for tobacco companies to perfect their argument that the trade agreement gives them a right to use their trademark. So if you think you can take it from us, you really have to pay because your government just said it. It's a right. Um, let me just skip down to tariffs. This is pretty obvious, but the, Z the TPPA proposes to phase out tariffs. There's a lot of research that shows that when tariffs fall, smoking rates increase. And it's not for the reason you might think. It's not because cigarettes become cheaper. It's because when tariffs fall, it's easier for multinational companies to enter the market. And when they do, they enter with their marketing power. And they market the hell out of their cigarettes. Um, the real country at issue is probably Vietnam, which now has 135% tariffs on imported tobacco. And so if those are brought down significantly, particularly if they're zeroed out, there will be a massive turnover in the Vietnamese tobacco market. That market now looks like 45% of the men smoke, 2% of the women smoke. The country average is, average is about 26%. Not a whole lot higher than the United States country average. But what will probably happen in Vietnam is if tariffs go down and multinationals enter the market, they will market to women like they did in Japan, like they did in Korea, like they did in the Philippines. And so they'd be putting out cigarettes in pink packages in attractive accoutrement that you can stick in your purse with characters and logos that appeal to teenagers. I'm, I'm now pretty much paraphrasing what they did in those three other Asian countries, where the smoking rate among women went from 5%-ish up to 25%. So that's what they're aiming at. That's the market. And that gives you a sense of the potential impact that zeroing tariffs could have if it's part of the TPPA. The other TPPA countries have tobacco tariffs in the range of 5 to 15 percent. So going down to zero is obviously a noticeable change, but it's not as dramatic as Vietnam. The other dimen dimension here is that when countries don't charge the tariffs, they're not, they don't have the income that they would otherwise get from the tariff, which is in effect, in effect discriminatory because they're able to charge countries bringing tobacco into the country, companies bringing tobacco into the country, rather than taxing companies already in their country. So it's a way to export your tax burden on foreigners. Uh, you lose that when you zero out tariffs. But conversely, that's the reason why the United States is asking countries to drop their tariffs. 